I said, why don't you just write down the foods that you see on each commercial? What type of commercial? And so she did, she did a good job and Michelle, Michelle added to it. But between the two of them, they did over 100 commercials. And uh, what they what we did was grade them. If you saw fruits and vegetables, that would be a plus. Uh, if you saw animal products, refined grains, uh, dairy, any any kind of uh, something with saturated fat, high sodium, sugar sweetened beverages, that would, each of those would be a minus one. And what we saw is that the majority of the food commercials was actually from fast food chains, and on average, they were showing something that had a minus three. That is three different things that are associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. Okay. And when the individual items did a little better, the grocery stores still a little better, <coughs> home delivery, maybe not as good, but still not as bad as fast food, uh, which was worse than all of them. Okay. So why are we focusing on commercials? Because they work. And when I was a young college student, all of a sudden the cigarette commercials disappeared. Why? Because of legislation recognizing that that marketing dangerous things to the population was going to cost the government a massive amount of money uh, in healthcare. That's just simple fact. And that is exactly what uh, folks in uh, the European Union and Canada have recognized. Uh, that is you, particularly for children. Don't do this kind of advertising. But it's not just about ch children. It is, but it's not totally about them. It's about the fact that marketing affects the poor more than the rich. Why? Because poor people watch more television by a lot uh, than people who are wealthy, probably because the people who are wealthy are working all the time and don't just don't have time to sit in front of a television and, and watch it for more than five hours. So then we have the issue of our, um, our junk food industry, tax dollars and subsidies that are making unhealthy food more inexpensive. So it's more accessible to the poor. And that is really contributing to even worsening of our, um, uh, our healthcare disparities. So then you have this whole idea of food deserts where uh, you feel like there's not enough food for the poor people because it's not accessible. So the food desert, yeah, healthy food not being sold in local stores, uh, I, I know when I moved to Louisville, they were calling it a food apartheid. Some people call it a food swamp because it's just poor quality food, but swamps are actually good things. So I'm not, not a fan of that term, but I understand what they're saying. And I, that's why I'm saying that they really are, that the word is misspelled. I'm saying that food deserts should be called food desserts because that's what's happening. You have people going out and buying things because they're inexpensive for the reasons we talked about. And the this, uh, as long as the people prefer uh, buying this kind of food, this is what's going to happen. Uh, why? Because this, the stores, grocery stores, are not in the healthcare business. They're in this don't go out of business business, and they will sell what people buy. So I'm saying the food deserts or food desserts are us. That is, if we haven't started in first grade or prenatal, getting people to understand a whole food plant-based diet is what they should be eating, then they're going to buy things uh, that are ruining their health and the stores are going to sell them. So don't blame the stores. Uh, we have to blame our, our own system. Okay. Um, so we, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think the answer is. Here's the guidelines, section 3.1. We talked about it, uh, what does it actually say? Okay. Okay. Uh, we, okay. We talked about not smoking, making sure you know with your cholesterol and getting it under control. Same thing with the blood pressure. Um, same thing with your, with your blood sugar. Not using aspirin for primary prevention. Um, uh, like we were saying in the past, we had that wrong for several decades. Uh, physical activity, absolutely. People need to be doing more than 150 minutes a week for primary prevention, meaning you don't know that you have a disease, you don't have any disease, you haven't had a heart attack or anything. 
excuse me, um, I always say secondary prevention, once you're managing uh, a disease, you really should be at 300 minutes a week. But diet is that you know lower left-hand corner, more emphasis on uh, vegetables and fruits and nuts. And the this concept is so important. Here are the actual guidelines, more fruits and uh, uh, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, fish. So I know I took a lot of hits from my vegan colleagues about this, but fish swam into my guidelines. Um, they were literally forced down my throat by the American Heart Association. Why? Because randomized trials show that fish compared to red meat lowers stroke, doesn't lower heart attack rates, doesn't lower um, uh, cardiovascular death or overall mortality, at least not in the PREDIMED trial, uh, but it did, it did lower stroke. And unlike the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association is a stroke organization. Okay, so that's so that's the explanation of why you see that there. I wouldn't normally, um, left to my own devices, have any animal product in any guideline that I wrote. Um, so anyway, getting rid of saturated fat, um, getting rid of cholesterol, sodium, and uh, getting rid of processed red meat, refined carbohydrates, sweetened beverages, uh, are all actually very important. Now, what happens in terms of health equity if you actually improve the diet of the people who are at risk? We actually have that data. It came from Loma Linda year, almost a decade ago, where Gary Fraser actually tried to answer that question. We'll take a cross-section analysis of Black people in this Seventh-day Adventists. And what he found is that if they were doing a vegan or vegetarian diet, there was a 56% decrease in hypertension. Look at this, the diabetes, high cholesterol, all of it dramatically reduced. Now, the interesting part is that for the people eating fish, the so-called pesco vegetarians, you didn't see uh, substantial differences in the cardiovascular risk. Uh, and that goes along with the PREDIMED trial that showed no difference in heart attack no difference in overall mortality or cardiac mortality, only a difference in stroke. And so you could actually do uh, an intervention. And we actually did that on the south side of Chicago. I was fortunate to partner with Terry Mason, who many of you know, um, has been out there pushing for a uh, plant-based diet for a long time. And he is one of the health ministers in this church. It happened to be President Obama's old church on the south side. And we actually did a study where we asked people to come in, get their risk factors drawn, and then volunteer to have free food, a uh, whole food plant-based diet uh, for, um, for five weeks, and then come back uh, and have your blood tested again. And we did it over Lent simply because, and not when I was a kid in the Baptist church, but uh, Lent was a Catholic thing back then, but now it's pretty much everywhere. And it turns out that um, that African-Americans on the south side of Chicago usually give up something for Lent. And so we asked them to give up animal products and eat the free food. It seemed like it would work. And then write down uh, if they weren't able to comply with it. So what did we find? We found a dramatic, if you look in the middle red section, all those names of things, they're all cardiovascular risk factors that you can measure in the blood, and they all dramatically improved. This is what it looked like. The big the big ones that everybody should know about are insulin dropping. How does that happen? Because their weight went down. When their weight went down, their blood sugar went down. When their blood sugar went down and their weight went down, then their blood pressure went down. And so some of these results are mitigated by the fact that people came off of their drugs. Um, and so they were doing so much better. Then the other one, that four-letter word, Please write that one down if you're not familiar with it, TMAO, trimethylamine in oxide. That is actually a metabolite of animal products. <clears throat> so of course it went down dramatically, but it also is coated by the microbiome, that is the bacteria in your GI tract. And so we were able to lower a, a huge amount of risk uh, in the African-American uh, community uh, in that church. Yeah, completion rate was high, adherence was very high, 
and, and uh, people lost a, a lot of their risk. And this is what could happen to our entire society. To, we don't have to actually stop here. So I would say that that you know we have an opportunity to eliminate our healthcare disparities, just like we did with smallpox and yellow fever, uh, with polio, with HIV, and now with COVID. We have the proof of what we need to do. All we need to do is actually do it. We eliminate the disease and the healthcare disparity uh, disappears. So I would, um, at this point, I'll, I'll stop here uh, just to say that the, the end of this, uh, the statistical analysis, we did put people back into the, uh, uh, their 10 year risk evaluation and 19% of that 21% increase that, uh, that's been uh, hovering over the black community, 19% of that risk was eliminated. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing right there and uh, open it up for questions. <music>